Good morning. Welcome to, good afternoon in fact, sorry, welcome to the FTS Bet Slip on the 13th of May. Sorry it's late, I've um, had things on. Um, okay, today we've got Steve Williamson later. Uh, Steve's a pre-race horse race trader. Um, it took a very roundabout route to get to that situation. Um, and Steve and I had a good chat for about 40, 45 minutes talking about all sorts really. Um, but more about his sort of life and how he got to where he is. Um, and I think we both have a very similar philosophy on um, gambling that um, unless you sort yourselves out, all the other stuff really won't fall into place. Um, so, yeah, very interesting chat with Steve coming up. But let's do a few other bits first. Uh, horses, those two horses, yes, they were rubbish, weren't they? I know one got back down. Um, right, the free betting simulator first. Um, match day two is up. Um, a few of you different love seeing the different tactics. Some people lump the absolute lot at it. Other people trying to stay carefully in the bank. Um, but A. Campbell, 1983. I, I don't know what bets you've had, but he is top of the leaderboard. Turned his 1,000-point bank on night one into £2,845.80. Uh, a phenomenal win. Joey Harve turned his into 2424 Um so all just sitting there, um, and next best is one four six zero CP Marsh. So that's the top three. Um, but keep going, see how you get on over the next few days. Um, as I say, got to play twenty days, and you've got to have had fifty bets. And you can join in at any time. You don't have to. If you've missed the start, you can still join in now. So ftsincome.co.uk and then at the top menu the free betting simulator a little introduction video and today's fixtures are up you've got to bet on those by nine o'clock tonight but i feel those guys at the top are boom or bust they're shipping it all in and they could go bust just as easy as they're winning big um right book of the day um been good as well on twitter I see a few of you giving me book recommendations um i had a couple myself uh, and i can't believe i haven't put this one up there i haven't checked i actually may well have done um but i can't believe if i haven't that um it's not there uh and that is uh bear with me i'm just uh because there's two books by the same author i'm going to give you one today and another one tomorrow um and the first one is uh, The Disciplined Trader. It's a bit more expensive, this one, but it's by a guy called uh, Mark Douglas, The Disciplined Trader. Um, and then tomorrow, many of you will know his other book that I'm going to give up just from that name. Um, fantastic book on on fantastic author on stuff like this and mindset for trading and discipline and how to go about it. Um, so Mark Douglas, the disciplined trader, uh, developing winning attitudes, um, but it's only available on Amazon in hardcover for about 28 quid, but it's a fantastic book. Um, so that's the book of the day. Right, well, let's now go into um, Steve. So yeah, as I said, I spoke to Steve earlier, and uh, that is coming up for you right now, about 40 minutes of me talking um, all sorts with Steve Williamson. So enjoy that. Right, morning. This morning, I'm very pleased to have on the bet slip um, Steve Williamson. Well, I'm really looking forward to because Steve's in a field that I've never looked at. So, uh, morning, Steve. Good morning, Ian. And uh, I am in a field, actually, you've never looked at. There's corn, there's barley, there's everything around me at the moment. I'm right in the middle of nowhere here. You're in the middle oh, yeah. of down in Cornwall somewhere. Yeah, rural, deepest, darkest Cornwall. Well, I, I must admit, I haven't got my face mask on, though. What's the weather like? <laughs> it's uh, sunny and a bit windy down here today, but yeah, it's lovely. Can't complain well, at all. I think with these restrictions, you may be influxed with tourists over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, I've got I've got the barriers out to go out onto the main road on the A30 and stop them all. Yeah, <laughs> good man. Um, right, Steve, you have got. I mean, you've sent me a little email here. We've obviously chatted a few times on the phone previously. Um, I, I, I met you through Twitter. Um, I just thought you gave great advice was sort of why I followed you. Um, but then you've sent me a little email here. I mean, you have been, you're like Phileas Fogg. You've been round the world. So. <laughs> well, I've, um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know really. Ian. I mean, my father was in the fleet air arm. So we, when I was young, we lived in uh, Malta a couple of years there, eight years in Scotland. 
uh, came down to Cornwall. And in, basically in Cornwall most of the time, but uh, I went to London when I was uh, 18 DJing up there. Um, and then Plymouth and uh, back down here. So what? Let's let's just go back to that. So you went to grammar school, which obviously, I mean, I don't know your age, but I'm imagining you're a similar sort of generation to me. Yeah, about thirty nine. <laughs> yeah, Gram, grammar school was was quite a thing back then. Um, I remember sort of when I left middle school, the kids going off to grammar school, and you did well, got O levels, A levels, and you decided with that to become a professional DJ. Talk us through. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. My parents weren't very impressed. They thought I was going into going to, uh, I suppose, either the services or banking or accountancy or something like that. But I'd always, uh, I'd always love music. I mean, music's been the biggest part of my life. I guess, uh, I suppose, since about seven, eight years old. I used to record uh, all top of the pop things on reel to reel tape recorder back in the sixties, and um, I went to the local youth club because i mean years nowadays people go out when they're 13 14 but back then you didn't really go out to youth clubs and stuff until you were sort of 16. And i went there and i thought ah this is what i want to do and so i uh, did the a levels and that and then informed my mum and dad that i was going to uh, become a professional disc jockey and go to london <laughs> so so when you so you set off where were you living at the time when you did that cornwall yeah i was down in cornwall at, uh, so, Elston, you set yes. off, so you set off to cornwall for from Cornwall to London. Yeah. What was the plan? Where were you going? Where were you heading to? Because that seems, that seems quite a scary thing to do. Well, no, I had a mate of mine, in fact, my best mate, who was, uh, he was DJing there already, and uh, he worked for an agency. We, we, we lived in a, in a house in Harleston. It wasn't the most salubrious place at the time. Every uh, car had a dent in it in our road, and there was about eight DJs living in a house there. And we're talking about when uh, when it was being bombed in the 70s. So um, it was an interesting time. And uh, so did all the pubs, the lunchtime gigs with the strippers, which as an 18 year old, it was a, a <laughs> bit of a, 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 an eye opener. And um, then we used to tour in a 3500 weight Luton Transit right around the country, literally nonstop um, with uh, na doing naval bases, colleges and youth centres and that. And Pete used to sleep in the front of the cab, and I had a couple of base bins uh, and a sleeping bag in the back of the van. Like that was my bed, you know. But uh, wow. but good experience, good experience. Yeah, wow. And um, I mean, we our paths may have crossed. I mean, I don't know what because I I mentioned uh, <laughs> one of my stories when I got smacked in the mouth in Oakhampton. Oakhampton, yeah, yeah. I, uh, it's funny yeah. because um, yeah, I was back down here then, but I, I said I, at the time I remember when you did the story I commented on it and I was I actually the guy who had that place he had three clubs there one in um Launceston then the Nero's in Oakhampton and another one up near Bude um but I did occasional one sort of once a month in Oakhampton but that was a that was a bit of a bit of a dive really that place oh, but, was um, dive. yeah the, um the, yeah. I just I've got to ask a name of you because there was a character in Oakey that he <laughs> that guy called Phil Blundell I just no. I don't, I don't know anyone there. Don't know no, anyone. okay. No, I just wonder no. if you ever came across him because that was the. No, guy. I was. Um, no, I was, I was always one of these people. I just sort of got in, did the job, got out. Like you know, nobody out. knew where I was from or whatever. I just uh, always tried to keep a private life to a private life, you know. But um, um, so you're back in Cornwall now. So how did you obviously leaving going to London? How did you end up back down there? Um, I suppose I'd had I'd, I'd, I'd done enough up there. And so I came back down here uh, and then I sort of was basically got into the just DJing in clubs, uh, Devon and Cornwall. Uh, and then I got introduced to racing by, in fact, in 1978, it was a um, guy who worked behind the bar came up and he said, oh, he said, do you do, you do the racing at all? I said, no, I said, um, don't know anything about it. He said, well, I got a horse. Uh, I think will go well in the derby called Remainder Man. I went, all right, okay. He said, well, do you want do you want to bet on it? I said, so, all right then. So, uh, so I had a tenner each way on this horse Remainder Man. Um, it came third, it's 33 to one. And uh, I remember picking up 92 pound 50 and thinking, oh, that's easy money. And so if that bet had lost, you may not be doing what you do now. Uh, quite possibly, yeah. Well, yeah, that would, that would be the case. I yeah. was... I was very lucky to start with. 
I mean, there's a saying that they did a, I watched a scientific program once and it was, are people who think they're lucky luckier than people who think they're not lucky, you know? And, uh, um, hello? Hello? Sorry, and yeah, just, uh, had somebody else trying to ring me and I'll just cut them off. No problem. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I was lucky then and I, I, I started, uh, I actually went to my first race meeting. I think it was in Newton Abbott. Uh, is it either 78 or 79? I can't quite remember now. And um, I had every winner on the day. And um, then uh, I suppose that my betting over the first... Hello? Hello? Um, so sort of back in favourites and not really knowing what I was doing. I, I lost you then for about five seconds. You said my betting over the first part and then I lost you. Yeah, it was a bit sporadic, really. I was sort of, I suppose I was an, a, a mug punter, shall we say, uh, like most people are when they start off. Uh, and then I think you you sort of, I'd, I've worked out that I actually wanted to do well at it. I've always wanted to do well at everything I do. Um, so I think you go from sort of knowing nothing to trying to find out absolutely everything so I could, I mean, even now I could tell you all the courses, all the undulations, uh, yeah. draw biases, everything like that. You you go from knowing nothing to then you have sort of, you're very, you know everything. And then after a while you go through that and you go through to like, to what I call it, like a mature simplicity when you work out what needs to be done and you just do it. Yeah, I, I agree with that totally. I, I think, I mean, I call it paralysis by analysis. I think people are, they go from mug punter to exactly <clears throat> thinking they've got to get every single piece of information. Um, and then you actually look at what do you use? You know, obviously I do football and, and I keep it relatively simple. Um, and people send me systems and spreadsheets. And I just think, wow, you've, you're, tying, you're tying me up in knots, yourself up in knots. Um, yeah. There's just no need for all that. I, I actually think Ian, that nowadays, um, if you can't make a profit from whichever sport you're interested in, then you'll never make a profit because there's more, there's more information available now than there's ever been. Um, and the biggest factor by far, in my opinion, um, is your own discipline. Yeah. I, uh, I know, I know we commented it on Twitter. You've mentioned yeah. it and I, it, you know, there's a million things you can do. Just work out what you can do, do it properly, and stick with it. I agree with you to totally. I, I couldn't. I mean, that's like words coming out of my mouth. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so you had you betting with people like Mark Holder and that in the nineties. Um, well, actually, yeah, Mark, Mark was very influential because I came across Mark. He was running a tipping service. Uh, Mark's father was Richard Holder, uh, a racehorse trainer, and Mark still actually is involved in they, they had horses as well and he basically was making money out of, of betting horses which is a which he still does with a, a private service now what i learned through mark uh i went up to his office in portis head uh, just outside bristol back in i think it's about 93 94 and i really began to learn about value uh and how the short price things were over bet and combine i mean mark had videos floor to ceiling there of every race and you know he knew all the sectionals he knew everything um and shortly afterwards there's a guy called alan potts who joined him and alan had a book out called uh, against the crowd again excellent judge and you know you, you you just learned a lot from these people there's i mean everyone has an opinion but the only opinions worth listening to are people who have actually done it and actually know how to do it. Uh, there's so much waffle around. And so I suppose, really, I moved into um, each way betting predominantly. And it would be exactly the same now if you could get the bets on, taking on the short price favourites with, with value horses, like we've report, we called before, like the slag bets, if you like. Slag each way, you yeah. know. And I used to go around the shops, that's what the boys used to do. And yeah, and that's what we Yeah. Uh, they'd ring you up and say it's a slag each way, you know, try not to draw attention to yourself. That's, uh... Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the only problem with those ones, I mean, it was quite good because the, uh, the bookmakers down here, I got to, I mean, I because I used to frequent the mall, or the, hey, the mall, I mean, you used to use a Hills office in Truro, which is actually still 
to this day, it, it's no longer there. But it was a great office because it was a huge bookmakers and half of it was no smoking. So, but, you know, it used to be about 20 regulars there. I mean, where you had regulars who used to like horse racing and that. Now you don't get that. Everyone's playing the FOBTs and rubbish like that. I mean, I, remember, I can remember when they came out and I said, well, that'll be the next tsunami of young gamblers coming on the on the scene like and i yeah. used to equate that, that what they did they really anybody playing machine they're not taking any responsibility for what they're doing i mean you know you've only got had to be in the bookmakers years ago i mean it'd be the same with football i guess but predominantly more with horse racing where somebody would back something it run badly and they blame the jockey they blame the trainer they blame everything but they'd never blame their own judgment like you know yeah um anyway so i used to you know in the mornings like for example at ladbrooks at nine o'clock they would have their bad each way races priced up uh and hills would they all do the same but i used to try and get on early and maybe so if there's a a, a one to three shot and there's a four to one shot i'd be obviously on the four to one shot each way and i had a fair amount of success with that. I had two instances where at one point, I think it must have been in the early 2000s, Ladbrokes introduced a loyalty card, which I guess was the same as a, a Tesco club card. So they knew your modus operandi. And uh, I went in the one in Newquay one day and went to put a £50 each way double on. And uh, the till just made a noise. The phone rang and they said, well, tell the man he can have £25 win. Um, and that was the end of the the Labrooks card, I just cut it up in front of them and threw it away. Um, Hills, the same. One day I was at Warwick. There's a race at Warwick, a hurdle race. I had a couple hundred pound each way on a horse at nine to one. I mean, I'm only playing for the place and the thing won. Yeah. Uh, so every every phone bet to Hills after that was had to be referred, you know. I mean, I'm, and I'm saying phone bets and that because obviously at the time, this is before everybody was using online betting like, you know. Yeah, that's it's, right, yeah. You're talking but, um, carbon copy slips, son. That's the days, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess that, I mean, what I did eventually, I I, I was doing it on a, I, I thought it was quite a good system at the time, whereby I started off with uh, using, I thought, right, what I'll do, I'll have to start off with £25 each way doubles, and I'll should just increase the bank or reduce it, but using 5% of the bank, and either increase after a winner or decrease after a loser and that built up to about five grand fairly quickly it was it seemed so easy really i had like envelopes on top of the wardrobe with a grand in that one then a grand and you know going on like that mm. but of course once you start getting to 150 150 pound each way 200 pound each way doubles you just couldn't get them on couldn't get them on um and so therefore uh i can remember i had one guy who worked for the tote as a manager who was he was he was all right you could he'd let you put a bet on in different handwriting and things like that you know uh but eventually eventually you know we had to go to um i mean i was on betfair i i signed up with betfair in 2003 i think um so yeah and it's all pretty much all been online since then and what made, what made you and at what stage made you decide so you've opened your betfair account 2003 what made you then think this is what i want to do actually full-time for a living well i was even at the very beginning when i started the uh, betting on the horses i loved racing i loved it i found fell in love with it and i went to the 1981 derby with shergar, shergar. i'd actually back i'd actually backed him at 20 to 1 before a race called what they used to call be called the guardian classic trial at sandown um and of course he then went to chester and one shortened up into about, to about nine to four and on the day for the derby it was 10 to 11 and obviously one by 10 lengths yeah uh and obviously subsequent events have proved it to be a historical derby for yeah. all the wrong reasons um i then went to the arc in the same year when ardross henry cecil's horse was the, uh, one of the favorites but that was won by 53 to one shot gold river and uh you know, you get experiences in life of things which you either get a positive experience or a negative one. Well, that time when I went to Paris, I actually went on a coach 
from Birmingham to Paris. And I vowed then I'd never go on a coach again. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Suggsy's trip to Madrid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've always, always loved, loved going racing. And I just thought that if I could earn a living from something that I really liked, then that was great. You know, it wasn't a question of, I want to make millions. I just want to make a living from something that I enjoy. I, I got to know when I was going to all the tracks down here, Exeter, Newton Abbott, uh, I went, to the, we went to the four of us used to go to the point to point meetings on a regular basis. And we're talking about every week, all the way through the seasons. And of course the West country is a, uh, is one of the strongholds of point to point and national hunt racing yeah. uh, with, with David Pipe and previous to that, Martin, uh, Paul Nichols, Hobbs, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Southwest and a lot of the jockeys that are riding national hunt now, they made their way up through point to point. And, um, you know, and I, so I got to know people in the racing industry and I knew a lot of the bookmakers and some of the bookmakers I used to, I really respected. I really respect, I still do. Um, the bookmakers that have an opinion, they'll actually have an opinion on something. I, I don't respect the, the, the big companies, though, because they, they're just accountants. That's all they are. They're accountants. Yeah. But, I mean, there was one guy who used to work at Newton Abbott. And what they used to do, they would lay, they'd work out the, a short price favourite that day. And they'd say, maybe a, there was a good example. One, they'd, they'd lay it for up to a thousand pound at Newton Abbott back then. And that was, uh, so the horse had won last time. So you, your average punt is going to be on it. But it had won last time in a time about 34 seconds slower than the average. And so it wasn't an even money shot or whatever. And, that, you know, you learn things like that, Ian, from different people and that. And constantly being like a sponge, learning, and that it, it just helps you to to get ahead of the game a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, fantastic. And I've, I've got to go to one of these lines in this email because I'm just staggered by this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously, you're a fan of going to Cheltenham. Actually, I'm going to ask you, flat or jumps? What are you? Flat or jumps, man? Jumps, 100%. Um, the, 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 reason I, the reasons behind that, I would say that, firstly, one gets to know the horses over a period of time. Uh, I mean, I've had several favourite horses. Uh, Vatour, uh, Duvin, there's been several. And they're, they're there for years, and people get to know them and get to love them. Whereas... I can't say I don't like the flat. Racing is racing. But when it's all about money, bloodstock, breeding, yeah. then a horse is ra racing for two or three races and then it's off. You know, I mean, Frankel was obviously, you know, exception to the rule, exception yeah. to the rule. But, but generally speaking, yeah, but, I mean, people like to watch horses that they know, you know. Yeah, I love the jumps. And in, 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 November 2006, you started working on the anti-post markets for the Gold Cup 2007. Yeah. Um, I mean, this well, is what a, happened. I just let what me happened? just tell people yeah. your your worst result was 400 pounds, and yeah. your best result was 82 grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I um, how that came about was, I was a huge fan of Corto Star right from the very beginning. Yeah. I was at Exeter when uh, when uh, he uh, unseated Ruby Walsh at the penultimate fence. Uh, Ruby then remounted, and I believe they've beaten half a length in a photograph. And after that happened, then the jockey club banned the remounting of horses. So anyway, so it was November the 19th, 2006, and Quarto Star was favourite for the Betfair chase at Haydock. I think that was the inaugural running of the Betfair chase. And at the time, it was a hundred. It was um, twelve to one for the Gold Cup the following March. So I had a hundred pounds on him at twelves. And then after he'd won that very easily, he reduced in price. And then I thought, oh, that's okay. So then I've got no liability there at all, but a few points. I can't remember. I think I laid it at four to one after that. But then there's one of the horses uh, called Kingscliff. Now Kingscliff had won the Great Hunter Chaser. And he had won the uh, Hunter Chase at Cheltenham, the Fox Hunters there. And we knew that he was going to run in the Gold Cup, barring injury. Because of going to the point to points every week, the, the chap who was the, the owner, Arnie Sandell, he was going to run. 
So this horse was trading it 300, 400 on Betfair, all sorts of fancy prices because obviously he wouldn't win a gold cup, but we knew he was going to run. So as the race is getting nearer and we're going through the declaration stages, the horse is coming down in price. And by the time it actually, the race started, obviously he was in the, he, he ran, he was 33 to one. So by sort of buying, if you like, and, and selling at like 300 and then getting out and it, it created a book where the worst result was Corto Star winning 400 quid. There were several horses there were between 2000 and 5000. And should the miracle happen and Kingsley won it, then it'd be 82 grand as it was. Uh, he actually, I think he actually led for the first two or three fences. Great, great jumper, great jumper. And um, the funny thing about it was that at the time, I'm bearing in mind, I'm in the Hills office in Truro, and I'm taking my laptop in there on a daily basis. And I'm the only one in the bookmakers <laughs> who's got a laptop. And of course, the people around me say, what are you doing? Like, you know, so I used to show them and that. And, you know, so then the, the back in the lane of other horses started, you know, so it, it all sort of began like that, really. Right, amazing, absolutely amazing. I, I, I loved Corto Star, absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, brilliant horse, brilliant. I mean, uh, in actual fact, it's quite funny because in 2008, uh, when Denman won, uh, those of us that had been uh, watching points and that was a huge debate because who's going to, who was Ruby going to choose to ride? And he, it was Corto Star and Sam Thomas rode Denman. And that's right. Yeah. My, mate, my mate, my mate Dave, he said, "Oh, Denman's a tank. He, nothing will beat him." And well, they didn't. Obviously, he on that was his day, 2008. That was his day there, you know. Yeah, I but, was. Um, I, I was gutted when Denman won. I was absolutely gutted. I remember, yeah. I remember it well. I was absolutely gutted. Uh, yeah. Not on a punting point of view, just so badly wanted Corto Star to win. Um, yeah. And then this really interests me. In 2008, um, you read. Adam Heathcote's blog. Uh, yeah, which yeah, was that a, was. It was yeah. a famous blog online. Uh, I think it was on the Betfair forum linked to. He set out to uh, pre-race trade from zero to. I think it was a. I think his initial goal was one hundred and fifty thousand, and he ended up making three hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, yeah, I think I think, I think actually, it, it, yeah, it's something like that. But I thought I I, I had a feeling it was naught to three fifty. But anyway. I know he increased it, and, and of course, reading that, you think, well, oh, you tend to look up, and then I started reading the blog, how he started and that, and the funny thing is, with all the cynicism that's around in social media, which is obviously very prevalent nowadays, uh, people saying, well, does this person exist, is it all made up and that, and uh, I mean, Peter Webb will tell you, I think, that he, I think he once described Adam as the the most natural trader that he'd come across. I mean, I believe him right in saying that. I don't know the guy at all. I believe him right in saying he's about 24 years old at the time. He had a, uh, a Bachelor of Science at Exeter University or Computer Science. He's just a very clever guy, like, you know. He, and he then, was, yeah, he was. And he was one of the first. He was the first of the sort of, because that's pretty much, I got into, into it full time 2007. So I was well aware of this. And he was one of the first of the does he exist and the what you'd call online trolling i suppose now i mean yeah. i dread to think what would have happened if he'd been doing that, and <laughs> that and age, um with twitter uh because exactly that people were people were saying he was a uh, peter webb stooge and it was all made up and this that, and the other i remember it really well um yeah i mean i, I mean the, to me the, the the screenshots they were shown there you know i mean recently there's been cases where people have uh, falsified screenshots i mean uh, anyone who knows me knows that I mean, even you know, we're putting the Skype on here, on, on the iPad here. I am not a an analysis person. Uh, I'm not a technical person. I am instinct, personal experience. That's the sort of person I am like, you know, just yeah. uh, the way it is. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, what, I, what I saw about Adam and I, I, I believed, you know, and from there, uh that led me then to um going on the the only course i've ever done uh in all the years the only course i ever did was the bat angel masterclass course with peter in 2013 i think it was uh which is invaluable um you know as far as with uh, obviously we're talking pre-race now because obviously yeah. pre-race is a totally different animal from the in play in that um yeah 
It's uh, and it, it suited me. I'm quite risk averse. You know, I don't mind turning over thousands and thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands to earn a few bob like, you know, but as long as there's no risk there, you know. So so you went on that course, you come out of that. That was what, 2013. So seven years ago. Yeah. Um, you obviously wanted to go full time. What? Yeah. What? What between the course and getting to where you are now, I guess, what was the what was the trigger? Or did you come out of that course and everything clicked and you just started running with it? Or no, did... no, it's a bit. I would describe it as a bit like taking your driving test. The learning starts after you've done the test. Yeah. Now, I mean, come on to the the social media thing because I don't really do social media, but I had to when I was reading so much stuff on Twitter that I thought I've got to put some input in here because and the only reason I inputted stuff on there is because I made every mistake possible. I mean, the biggest fault that people have with pre-race trading is they make a mistake, the market goes the wrong way, oh, I'll, I'll let it go in play and it'll come back. And whilst maybe nine times out of 10 it does, maybe 19 out of 20 it does. The one time it doesn't, you're going to do your bank, you know. And uh, I can remember, I think it was at Fontwell, uh, I was in a position where my liability was uh, about £900. And I let this thing go in play. <laughs> and it led all the way. And the price contracted. And guess what? It won. And I'd done £900. And I mean, I put that and I put, put that in the media there. Because I wanted to show, I mean, I basically... How I got to where I am now is that I made every mistake possible. And you have to do that. You have to learn. But the thing is, like, whether you're doing football, racing, whatever you're doing, nothing wrong with making mistakes. But for God's sake, learn from them. And if you keep making the same mistake, then you're stupid. You should do something else. Yeah. I, I, again, I mean, it's like, honestly, it's, we're like, we're like brothers because it's that's exactly our that's the bit i just don't understand with people um how they keep doing the same thing every time thinking it's going to be different yeah uh, i mean i mean i mean really i mean in, in in practice i mean a, a pre-race market um it's not difficult or, you know, a, a price goes either up or down it's as simple as that um so if you were trading it randomly you go 50 50 um but then all the other things come into it, weight of money and that. I mean, for me, the racing market pre pre event is it's by far the best uh, pre event trading there is because everything like you with you with football, like cricket, tennis, everything happens in play. That's where the money is. I mean, the cricket volumes are huge, but they play. The only time I can remember, I mean, you you know far more than me on this, but. I remember a pre-race football match. I think it was Chelsea playing Man City in a League Cup game. And about an hour before the off, City announced they were playing teenagers. And the price on Chelsea came right in. And obviously, conversely, Man City's price went right out. But other than that, pre-match odds don't move much. No, that's obviously, with the, with the racing, they do. And, you know, all of my pre-race stuff is... I would say 90% of it is between five minutes before the off and the off. That's it. You're out a few and, seconds and, before the off. And just obviously there'll be guys listening to this who, who are aspiring to do, you know, do aspire to do what I do, aspire to do what you do. Uh, yeah. I've never, I've never, ever done pre-race trading. Um, yeah. I'm, I've never really un understood the movements of horses enough to do it and, and never take the time to learn it. What would your one bit of advice? Are you a, firstly, are you a back to layer or a lay to backer or do you do both? I do both. Um, you know, I suppose the natural instinct is to lay and definitely with short price horses. I mean, for example, let's say a market is opening up there's only a couple of horses in it. One's 1.41 and the other one's five. Well, you're going to be a layer of the 1.4 because the downside is far less than yeah. the upside. Uh, and that's, you know, that's one of the factors there. Um, you know, it's just, yeah, you'd automatically be, be, be a layer usually. But I'm, what you're looking for, what I'm looking for is every steam stops and goes the other way and every drift stops and comes back the other way. And 
it's you know it's being ahead of the game working out when that's likely to happen and obviously all the software that people have you know you can you can work it out um i suppose that in the early stages when you're looking at it so closely you want to get everything right and you're too close to it you're too close to it you just and the best thing is what you learn from experience or what i've learned from experience is you sit back watch just watch watch wait yeah and you don't have to play in every race yeah if there's, a, if there's a race where there's four or five with a chance if you don't know what's going to happen leave it leave yeah. it you know i mean one one day i mean it's what people have to get their heads around with the pre-race as opposed to what you do what others do in play and that it's a totally different thing i mean to illustrate that one day i actually uh, put a detailed screenshot of a horse that was trading about 1.39 to 1.42 and i've done six 200 pound trades in about 90 seconds to, sh to, to make a profit i think it's 462 or 496 something like that and i put it up there and one guy actually made the comment he said oh that's not much of a return on investment <laughs> but he didn't get it because that was in 90 seconds yeah you know, it wasn't a question of i'd invested 1200 quid to get that in in an hour and a half or something you know yeah it's a different it's a, just a different animal but, yeah it is but it's what you get, what you what you personally like, and what you get used to, and I I, I love it, like you know. Mm. And you, um, yeah, and, and as you've said, you you finally instilled that discipline to do it, and and you know, as we agree, I think that is, you can give people anything if they haven't got that, then they're never going to win, and that's the that's always been the key for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone everyone needs to work out what they want to get out of something, but also what they're going to put into something, and. This is one of the things nowadays where in this instant society, people seem to expect to succeed straight away with something, but it just doesn't work like that. I mean, you take, well, the classic example at the moment is with what's going on in the world with the doctors and the nurses, how much time it takes to get where they got to, to earning that money, solicitors and all sorts of people in all walks of life. It doesn't happen overnight and it no. can't happen overnight by you reading something on Twitter and sign up for this and this is this will happen no, no it's no. you you is the is the is the main the key ingredient there you know no that's exactly right i mean i just in this period i've held um several webinars with sort of fts members just little groups three four five people and and i've said to all of them um you've got to forget where i am now you're me in 2007 yeah. that's where you are and yeah. and i've and i've you know, it's a very condensed thing. I've pretty much crammed 13 years into five or six hours over the Internet. But I've sort yeah. of said to them, you've got to do it in stages there. And even now, you know, I talk about mathematical modelling at the end of games. I didn't start doing that fully properly till 2016. Yeah, um, yeah. When I met people like Chrissy Spreadsheets who could make it easier for me. Um, and, and they're off running off thinking they can build a mathematical model and they'll win tomorrow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. exactly it. You've got to put the hard yards in. Whatever you do in life, you've got to put those hard yards in. And, and again, it just exactly as you say, I just don't know why the gambling world is different. And people think they can go on Twitter and do it. And even going back to Adam's blog, I think Adam's blog was probably as destructive for many as it was good for others because i think adam people read that and thought well if he can do it i can do that it sounds easy yeah um yeah. and probably many back in that day got burnt you know diving in thinking there yeah, he he obviously had a great skill as you said peter said he did um and went up going going about his business um but it is it is it's a unique industry for that isn't it for people just thinking oh i can do this and it's easy uh, yeah I, I, I mean i would say that and I, I've all the way along when I've made posts on, on I mean, I put, used to put screenshots up of, say, £100 or £150 or £200 in a day or whatever like that. Not huge amounts, but pretty consistent. All adds up, and, don't it? Yeah, that's it. And, and yeah, it does for pre-race. I mean, it's, it's, it's a totally different animal with other things. But, you know, but, but one of the reasons I did it is not a question of showing off or anything like that or say, well, this is what I can do. A it's to help others and help them to show them how it can be done b it actually had a very good effect on me because if i know i'm going to post something i want to make sure i'm concentrating hard i want to get it right 
You know, yeah. I don't want to be a Wally like and you know put one up there. There we are. That's so I made a mistake again, and then I made the same mistake again. Like you know, um, I think anybody involved in the, the 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 racing business, there is something I would say is that regarding tips, right? Now I know that you've got you you're, you've got a, um, a a brilliant thing there with your um, uh, the rap tool that you use, and I quite actually I mean I'm not you know not involved in that at all, but I find it quite fascinating. Um, but regarding information, where people say you know years ago you say well mate mine's got a got, knows a horse and that there's a, there's a very good saying with uh, the information I've always used and it's those that know don't say. And those that say don't know yeah and particularly when it comes down to the backing or laying of horses although they all have uh form actually works out usually quite well but obviously the lower down the grades you go the more up and down the form can be and i remember do you remember sir clement freud who used to have a he's yeah. an article he's a yeah. really br- brilliant brilliant guy very dry sense of humor and he used to do articles in the sporting life and um, he, uh, he he did one once. He said, "Well, imagine he said, you're the owner of a horse, and some lad comes up to you in the in the paddock and says, oh, is he going to win today?' If he says yes and it doesn't, then you're an idiot for giving him the wrong information. And if it you say, if you say no, I don't get done. He's got a chance today, and it wins. Then you you know you can't win. You can't win. You know. And um, you have to bear in mind with horses." at the lower end of the scale, should we say, maybe some on the all weather, that the people who own them and the people who train them, they have to recoup their money because they're laying out a lot of money in A, the bloodstock, secondly, feed and everything else associated with the, with the horse. And they're not going to want to get their money on it four to five or 1.8 or whatever. They're going to be wanting to earn the money when it's 10 to one, 20 to one and that. So therefore, it's logical to assume that in the lower grade races than that, more moves are likely, you know. Yeah. Um, and so therefore, you'd much rather be a layer, which, which, I mean, during this lockdown phase, I am laying short price horses because obviously I can't do pre-race at the moment. Well, not 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 to any any degree at all. Um, but um, so you'd, ra- you'd rather be a, a, a layer of a short price horse than a backer, you know. And <laughs> When, when people are watching racing, they say, oh, that was a fix, that didn't win. Well, you know, uh, again, you've got to look in the mirror and work out why you're backing it. Because, see, a lot of these trainers, in fact, most of them, they've actually got where they've got. So they've had to bet their horses in order to make money, to make a living, you know. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, no, just, I agree. I agree the, facts of, the facts of life. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've met people in the game, um, you know, just just through the punting <clears> side, really, but a couple of them, then you meet people who own horses, and it's a fascinating world. It is an absolute fascinating world to me, how it all works. And like you say, the public, you know, I, I get information, but I know I'm getting it after it's really been acted on. You know, I'm not yeah, the first obviously. one. Yeah. I'm not the first one privy to it. I get it after, you know, the guys in Ireland have done their bit and then it's come over here and they've been around the shops and they say, oh, we've backed this. It's got a good chance, whatever. And and they always tell me what they've backed it up and I can see the price and make a judgment call whether there's, you know, value in me carrying on or, oh, they backed it at eight. It's now threes. I can bin it. Yeah, uh, I, I, must, yeah, I must give you uh, one bit of advice that we had, which was solid. When we were going to the point to points, uh the one of the uh sort of famous in the national hunt circle was the ruckers angela and william rucker and they had um state of play who won a hennessy gold cup and um in 2005 they had a horse uh, called kappa blue who eventually ran on went on to run uh placed in the grand national but was down to running the fox hunters it hadn't qualified yet but we knew uh, the, the the guys who went pointing knew that they rated that horse as good as state of play and uh somebody turned to me he said well if it's a question of if this is that good then it's a question of you know how far will he win by so uh at the time i think it's 2005 uh we had i think 50 quid on it each of us at uh a hills office at 10 to 1 and he duly won the fox hunters at 5 to 1 by 12 lengths you know yeah things like that you get a lot more bad bad information than, than good but that was a you know useful one you know yeah uh, yeah amazing it is amazing so you you chug along very nicely now what's the sort of long-term 
game plan for you? Just going to keep chugging away doing this? Keep breathing. Keep breathing. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all trying to do that at the minute, aren't we? <laughs> no, I think um, I actually, I think one of the things that may may let me down sometimes is that I'm not particularly ambitious to earn X amount of money. Uh, as I said, if I can make a living from this, I mean, I, I do like going to, when I go to Cheltenham every year, I've been going to Cheltenham every year now for about 20 years. I mean, as you get older, you, you have seats, you don't stand, and, you know, you like this year, I have the Grand National ticket, so I had the Princess Royal Gallery seats and that, so you do it do it properly. Um, so once we do all that, and have a good time in that, uh, if I can carry on with the pre-race, that'll, that'll probably probably do me like, you know. Um, I like going to big sporting events, and uh, ho- hopefully they'll return at some point. Uh, I don't but, know. Um, I don't know when I will come and join. We'll have a day at Cheltenham. Um, I think we're going to. Yeah, move. I, I really missed uh, the fact that I couldn't couldn't get to the the Lingfield thing. As you know, that uh, kidney stone problem has been sorted finally. Finally, I mean, yeah, it's, so it's we'll, finally got it all sorted out. Which is real... we'll get you, we'll get you up. I don't know whether it'll be this year. Depends what happens. But um, if not, then we'll do it next when, as you say, when sport returns and and we can go. Get. I think me, you, and Gadge together at the bar could be quite entertaining. <laughs> I tell you, I must must admit must admit one thing in that I did post uh, last year that I would like to go around the country and help some traders out. Just uh, you know, and I've got a, there's a guy in South End that I said I'd go and see. There's a guy in North Wales. There's a lady up in Dundee, and I'd be, love to meet more people who do this. Um, I've never had any intention of selling anything. You know, I've had two or three people say, "Oh, you know." I've, pay you to train me in that and i i don't really not really bothered about that i i just i i like people to do well and it's nice well you know like you you mean you like people to do well at what you you know with fts don't you you know it's uh, because you get you 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 get you know it's it's just nice you know so uh so hopefully well in fact once uh, this lockdown and everything finishes eventually even uh you get around the country a little bit and um bump into a few more people people like you know yeah well, we'll, we'll definitely meet up and i know there's certainly be a few listening to this who would love to be sat with you for a for a day or half a day watching what you do <laughs> yes, i, I know i mean I've had, I've had a bit of a bit of a checkered career in with uh with like doing bits of uh radio stuff and tv stuff and, and things like that and uh and and bit... talk to me uh, before we finish we've yeah, got yeah. talk to me about this 10 to 1 uh oh, miss bet this is a beauty this Oh, dear me. I mean, talk about missing a certainty. Uh, one of my best friends at the time, who's uh, sadly no longer with us, is uh, or was Steve Gadd. And Steve was the assistant tour manager with Iron Maiden for about 20 years, 25 years. And um, <laughs> I, I, I was listening to the radio one day and it said, oh, Iron Maiden have won best live band at the Brits. So I rang him up and said, oh, uh, Brilliant news for the band, isn't it? He said, yeah, he said, we, they gave us the award when we were rehearsing in Paris last week. I said, Steve, I said, did you not think about ringing me and telling me? Oh, he said. Yeah. <laughs> oh, me. I mean, that was, it was the same, I think it was the same year or the year before where a lot of Paul Weller fans had distributed £20 notes all around the southeast of England. It's Surrey, like, you know, picking it up. I mean, you wouldn't have gone in and tried to get a monkey on something, but you could certainly put tenors and that around yeah. and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was like, yeah. past the post lot, you know. Yeah, incredible. Wow. Yeah. But, um, anyway. So, right. Uh, well, well, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking to you. To be fair, you are one of one of one of gambling's true gentlemen for me. I'm very pleased to have met you over the last sort of year, eighteen months. I think you're an absolute top individual. Um, thanks, thanks, Ian. I, I mean, I did. There are. I have to say, I mean, you're a great guy. There are a lot of nice people around. Um, they say birds of a feather flock together. I, I just, I don't, I mean, I don't do much on social media. My, my daughters live in Western Australia. So, uh, and that was when the, when the rang, phone rang, it was actually Anna, my daughter trying to get hold of me on, on, on FaceTime there. Uh, so I'll call her back in a minute, but, um, yeah, there's a lot of nice people around and, you know, I remember, uh, an ex-girlfriend said to me many years ago you get more things with sugar than you do with vinegar and it's far better to 
to give in life and to help others if you can because eventually eventually what you give out will come back i mean you know it's, it's the way of the world like isn't it you know yeah so, i i agree with you totally i do totally agree and and i mean unfortunately i mean i i enjoy the banter on twitter i don't as i've said before i don't get involved in the gambling arguments because i just think it's fruitless um but it has but it's all you know what we do is quite lonely isn't it you know people don't understand that you know i I sit in my office all day. You sit in yours all day. Um, so it's a nice way to interact with people for me and have a bit of banter. Um, yeah, to, to, to be honest, I mean, I mean, I, there's only me and the cat at home now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this lockdown, I mean, I'm not really affected because I've been, <laughs> been doing it for, for years now. In actual fact, the last the last six years, I found that that was the one thing I did a bit of driving and a bit of selling of cars and that. So I did find that initially when I thought oh, I'll go full time, I did about four months and then I went back to, I did a bit, a little bit of driving and then I did that for about three months. And then I went back to this for like a year and then I did another three months. Like, you know, because it was like, it took me, took me a couple of years to think, right, that's it. I'm, that is it. That's all I'm going to do, you know, because yeah. initially I did miss the social aspect of, of talking to people, you mm. know, and because yeah. uh, it is, it is, you, you do have to be funny. My, my best mate said to me, he said, oh, he said, oh, you'd be all right as a lighthouse keeper or in the Antarctic and that, you know, he's probably right, you know, but yeah. you have to, you have a different mentality. Yeah, my friends call me Hermit. They always say, like, that's what they ring out. So you coming out today, Hermit? You know, if the foot was on the box or whatever. Um, good, but but that's what we do, isn't it? And you do, you, I guess you fall into it. Once you've done it for a while, you just fall into it and, and it becomes the norm. Um, I, I do say that when I, when I go to Cheltenham every year, though, I'm, I'm, I'm really boring when I go to Cheltenham because, I mean, that's, I love the racing. So, you know, the, the, I, don't, I don't trade when I go to Cheltenham because uh, I just enjoy the racing. I love it. And, you know, anyone who knows who's been there over the last 20 years with me, I've got two or three mates that we always go there every year. And they're like the first day and the second day, they'll know which races I bet in. And I don't, I, you know, I'll have a bet in the, the novices hurdle or the champion hurdle. I don't touch any of their handicaps because they're too difficult. I've got no, in, no interest in trying to pick the 14 to one winner of a 27 runner handicap. Like, you know, it's just... Uh, doesn't doesn't appeal to me like i'd rather <laughs> when when um you go when, when mullins sent uh duva to cheltenham he said his quote was and you always got to listen to you pick out the right things to listen to as opposed to all the all the noise that's around and that year he said or oh, duva is probably the best horse we've ever taken to cheltenham well bearing in mind the previous year had been Vatour and Faheen. You know, to say that Duvan was the best horse he's taken there, that you've got to listen to things like that. And obviously, you know, he, he won very easily in the, the novice hurdle, you know. But uh, so I do love going racing. And, uh, you know, it's like when I go racing, like at Lingfield, wherever I go on an FTS do, I'll just enjoy the day. You know? Yeah, well, I do, I, that's what I do. I mean, I just like you say, I, the days out that we have because you're sort of stuck indoors. I go, you know, I like to have a bet when I'm at the races, but I just. Uh, I do remember. I do I remember. Like I know I wasn't there, but I do remember you had a huge prize winner at Lingfield. I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Because yeah. I, I remember thinking. How the bloody hell did he pick that? Yeah, very, yeah, yeah. I, I, the one thing I will never claim that I pick any of the horses. I do use the FTS stuff, but when I get those horses I put on the pod, they never come from me. They're uh, it's always people who know far more about it than me. Uh, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I can't thank you enough. Um, I will speak to you soon, and we will meet up after this. But on behalf of uh, all at FTS, I just want to thank you for coming on this today. Um, no, I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed it thoroughly, and um, I just uh, I hope that maybe someone somewhere will get something out of it that will that'll help them. And uh, if anybody does want any sort of help in the in the coming months and that, if I'm ever in your their areas, I'm quite happy. To, I'm quite amiable to talk to anybody. Brilliant. I'm not fussy who I talk to. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, Steve. As I say, can't thank you enough. And um, Steve Williamson, everybody. Cheers, Steve. Thanks very much. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Cheers, thank you. Bye-bye. 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 As with all my guests, um, big thank you to Steve for coming on, talking to you guys. Um, may even, as I said, do another one with Steve on um, when when we've actually got some horse racing, talk a bit more about the mechanics maybe of what he does if we can. Um, but 
just shows you again, guy, you know, went to school, came out DJing and is now a a profitable horse trader and very, very helpful. He's at genuinely, I'm not just saying it because they come on here, absolute nice guy. I, I got drawn to Steve just by reading some of the stuff he wrote on Twitter, um, trying to help people um, and my dealings with him over the last year whenever I've spoken to him, um, nothing but fantastic and and very helpful so i'm sure some of you will be contacting him because of his generous offer there but for me just a big thank you steve for coming on um and i hope racing returns for you soon but keep going with your stuff on the us and australia best of luck to you and i'll speak to you soon um I've been working hard for the weekend football court i i am taking it up to new levels of some of the stuff i'm doing um I can't wait. Looking forward to it. Um, I don't know whether I might tweet some live bets on the weekend. I'm probably going to be involved in two or three games looking at the numbers. Um, so I may tweet some live bets. For those of you in the trading group, I'm just going to take a watching brief on that this week. Um, just want to see if these stadiums and anything makes any effect. And then the following week, we've got games from Poland, Portugal coming back. So... Um, I'm going to look to resume my official trading stuff probably the first week of June um, when we've got everything back and we've just had a couple of weeks to see how these games pan out. Um, I can't see it will make a massive difference but I just want to see how they price up these no fans and stuff like that when we get some confirmed pricing um, on the weekend. But um, I've got some nice numbers that I want to have a look at. So I might just put those over Twitter over the weekend. I think all the games are live on BT as well, aren't they? Um, and talking of TV, um, the last dance on Netflix, I've not enjoyed. Well, since I watched The West Wing, I've not enjoyed TV um, since it. And I watched The West Wing about 15 years ago. Um I sat and watched two episodes of that last dance last night. Absolutely brilliant. Really, really enjoyed it. On Netflix, it's the story of Michael Jordan's um, career, really, and but focusing on that last season, 97, 98, but flashing back to when they traded him and everything. Fant honestly, absolutely superb um, winning guy. As I said, my Sam, we went to the Ryder Cup at the K Club, and Sam stood and spoke to him for... 10 15 minutes and didn't even know who he was an absolute lovely gentleman um but yeah yeah i'm absolutely i could have one of those programs last night to force myself to turn it off and go to bed because i could have sat and watched every episode um so i'm going to watch a couple more tonight but the last dance on netflix if you haven't seen it that's as good a sports documentary as i've ever seen um really really enjoy it. I'm you know I've never really watched basketball obviously we're well aware of Michael Jordan is but um absolutely brilliant loved it um what else have I got we've done the football simulator um oh we've got um I've got a recipe fish pie one of one of the nation's favorites fish pie I'm going to talk you through this fish pie because it is beautiful genuinely um so this is really good uh going to make the mash but first so we just want you want 750 grams of decent potatoes maris pipers desiree's um, peel and cube them uh, and boil them um, so just get them in boiled soil or boil until tender and then get them through if you can you want to really mash them well or get them through a potato ricer if you can um, is even better um, and in that process add 75 grams of butter 50 ml of hot milk um, a couple of egg yolks, uh, season it with salt and pepper, get it nice and smooth and put that to one side just to cool slightly. While that's on the side, get two shallots um, and some thyme and get that in a pan and uh, saute it and not burn it until the shallots are soft. Um, if you haven't got shallots, you can use an onion. Um, and then you want some, and I've never known how to say this, but I'm going to say it as it is, Noali Pra is how I say it. it it's the uh, vermouth, Noali Pratt, Noali Pra. Um, you want um, a good 100, 150 mil of that. Get that in the pan with the onions once they're softened down. Turn the heat up and boil, and boil it down so it's reduced right down. Then turn, stir in four tablespoons of 
plain flour and cook that for a minute or two and then add 250 ml preferably fish stock if you haven't got fish stock use vegetable stock but you can get fish stock um, pots and fish stock cubes 250 ml get that into the shallot and flour mixture um, mix it in and boil that for five minutes until it sort of reduces down by 30 percent uh, then add in 200 ml of milk and lower the heat simmer that down until it's um, lost again about another 25 percent then salt and pepper it add in four tablespoons of double cream and parsley and stir it and you should have quite a creamy type mixture now um, then you get your fish so you want whatever you want to put in it and i use smoked haddock um, salmon cod and some prawns you could use scallops if you like um, so i sort of 250 grams of, of smoked haddock 250 grams of um, cod break all that up and drop it in the bottom of a baking tray and I butter it in a sort of pie dish. I butter it and then I put that in. Some prawns, put some lemon juice in there, a little bit of dill in there. Uh, and then pour your sauce mix over the top of that. So your creamy your creamy sauce. A um, bit of parsley on top of that. Uh, and then just get your mash and spread that over the top of the lot. If you like cheese on the top, which I do then, just grate some cheese over the top of the whole thing whack it in the oven on about 180 for about 10 minutes um, and then turn it up slightly um, and another 10-15 minutes until the potatoes go in sort of brown on top um, so that's that's it it's, it's beautiful fish pie absolutely love it in fact my mouth's watering i'm gonna have to order some fish in my next shop and get that bought um what is it it's wednesday isn't it yeah no that's it so we've got um yeah as i say everything really gearing towards friday and these these games um ultimate will run as normal i'm going to say that every day just because i'm reminding people but in the meantime play the fts income uh simulator football and i will be back with you tomorrow um for more of the same FTS simulator football book of the day maybe a recipe um, might even dig out a story if I've got time but it all depends I'm, I'm snowing myself under with work um, right enjoy yourselves have a lovely um, Wednesday and I'll be back with you tomorrow morning